what we're seeing right now is that there are definitely more bears around than there were 50 or 60 years ago. And what that means, particularly for small Arctic communities, is that the people living there don't have memory within their lifetimes of how to deal with polar bear conflicts. Welcome back to El Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Susan Crockford, who is an evolutionary biologist and has been working for more than 40 years in forensic zoology. She is the author of the book, The Polar Bear Catastrophe That Never Happened, which is today's topic on episode 30 of El Podcast. Thank you, Susan, so much for joining us today. Well, it's wonderful to be here, Jesse, and it's good to talk to you. So let's just jump right into this. In your book, The Polar Bear Catastrophe That Never Happened, you write, In short, the peculiar way in which polar bear conservation status has been defined is too confusing to be viable. It is entirely correct to state that polar bears are currently thriving. Can you explain what you mean when you say polar bears are currently thriving? thriving. What I mean by that is that all of the reports from studies that are being undertaken in the Arctic are indicating that virtually all of the subpopulations that they study, and there's 19 of those right now, the females are in good condition. They're fat, as they should be, and that there's no indication of large numbers of starving bears around. So those kinds of indicators suggest that the bears are doing well in most parts of the Arctic. And that's really in contrast to the conservation status of threatened with extinction that we get from the U.S. Endangered Species Act or from the IUCN, the International Congress on the Conservation of Nature. And those are the folks who do put together a red list of endangered species. The, their assessment of the conservation status is based entirely on predictions of what would happen in the future, not what's happening at the moment. You've been a zoologist for 40 plus years. How did you get into this field? What kind of interested you? And what are some of the misconceptions or myths that you've uncovered over the last 40 years of studying not just polar bears, but walruses and seals. I've seen that you've written quite a few papers on dogs as well. My interest is largely in evolution, in trying to understand how one species would turn into another. And that's driven my interest. And I got into this specialty of identifying animal bones from archaeological sites just as a bit of serendipity actually, as trying to get a summer job when I was at university. It turned out that I was good at it, and it was a really interesting kind of thing. And what it did for me, I think, was that it emphasized some of the principles of evolution in the sense that I could pick up a bone that was 8,000 years old and match it up with the same species that's still living today. It showed me that there was this constancy of the skeletal shape that was going on over time. And that's, of course, the same principle that paleontologists use to identify a bone that they find that's millions of years old and that they designate a species. So I've always been more interested, even as I've been doing this work for archaeologists, I've been more interested in what it's been telling us about animal populations over thousands of years. And whereas archaeologists and anthropologists are more interested in what it says about the relationships between people and animals. But I could see that the information that we were collecting was really telling us something as well about what the animals were doing. And one of the projects that I was interested in the early 2000s was in the Aleutian Islands. And it was an archaeological site that had been occupied between about 25,000 and 35,000 years ago. We were expecting going into it that there would be the animal bones from the refuse heaps of animals that were there now, 
the, the same kinds of things that we would see seals and sea lions and sea otters and that kind of thing. But instead, there was walrus and ring seal and the odd bit of polar bear and ice-associated species, which was telling quite a different story, suggesting that the climate at that time was bringing the sea ice in the Bering Sea much further south than it comes today. And that's kind of really what I'm always looking for in some of these studies, is just any information that would tell us anything about whether the climate was different at some point in the past. Climate change is often seen as a major threat to the polar bears, but your book suggests that other factors such as hunting and human bear conflicts may be more significant. How can these issues be addressed to ensure the continued survival and thriving of polar bears? The focus seems to be on climate change and more specifically on future changes that are predicted to occur. But the conflicts with people and that sort of thing are issues that all biologists concede are potential issues. But it really just seems to be the climate change narrative that takes over. And what we're seeing right now is that there are definitely more bears around, for example, than there were 50 or 60 years ago. And what that means, particularly for small Arctic communities, is that the people living there don't have memory within their lifetimes of how to deal with polar bear conflicts. So for this generation of people, it's something new. Having a lot of bears around is a new experience for them. And so, for example, things like going out, taking families out onto the landscape to do the traditional collection things that they do, collecting birds' eggs and hunting and things like that, if they're operating along the shoreline, there's a potential for encountering a polar bear there now, whereas, say, 20 years ago, there wasn't. So it means a new level of knowledge and a new level of alertness and figuring out methods of how to deal with those sorts of encounters without losing a human life and hopefully without losing a polar bear life. And that those things are kind of new issues that are coming up. So how many more polar bears are around now than, say, 20 years ago? It's hard to say for sure because of the way that experts are counting the bears, are presenting the data. And it's a topic that continually comes up for me that I've tried to address over the years. But for example, there's a number of subpopulations in Russia that have not been surveyed. And so the polar bear biologist in there doing their counts of what the global population is, put that population at zero which makes no sense. No one assumes that is zero. What I've done is gone through all of the information that there is, and I am suggesting that right now, if you include all of those populations and put a reasonable estimate on it, based on similar ones that we do know, that the population should be somewhere in the vicinity of 40,000. Now, the official count that the biologists are giving is somewhere between 22,000 and 31,000. So really, 40,000 is not that much more. It's within the realm of possibility if you consider all of the information that's available. So in 1973, a lot of the Arctic countries signed a treaty to protect the polar bears, which would include Russia, Canada, the U.S., that's right. yeah. Gr Greenland, etc. And how many polar bears were recorded in 1973. And then you're saying now we have maybe 40,000. So what did we have before the Polar Bear Treaty was signed in 1973? The count that was, it was in the late 60s. So just prior to those treaties, the count was, depending on your source, is somewhere between 5,000 and 15,000. So I've taken a halfway point of that and I use a benchmark of about 10,000 for that particular time. It has to be, I think, somewhere in that neighborhood because the treaty would not have been enacted 
if all Arctic nations hadn't been extremely concerned about what was happening with the numbers. So to me, it fits with the narrative and the push to have an international treaty at that time. And then can you kind of talk about how these polar bear numbers are actually tabulated? Are they just going out there in a helicopter, flying around, counting these these bears? Or what's the process on this? Well, they, they don't actually count them all, of course. And what they do is they count what they can see, but recognizing that there's going to be bears they miss. A bear might be hiding under a bush. It might be underwater. Uh, it might be not in that particular area. And so it really is an estimate of what they think is a good possibility, given the number of bears they can see. And unfortunately, it's all predicated on assumptions that they have, you know, how many they might have missed and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, over the years, they've used different models to estimate those numbers. Those models have changed just about every time they do a new survey. And the assumptions have changed every time they do a new survey. So it makes it very difficult to compare one estimate to another, even within the same area. In your book, you mention that there might be a range. I think you say that you, you kind of think the average is 39,000, 40,000, but you say that the range could be from 26,000 to 58,000 polar bears. And kind of one of the, the major themes of your book is that there's a lot more polar bears than what the experts want you to believe. What's the motivation to lie and say that the polar bears are dying instead of thriving? What's the motivation? Why do these people want to lie to people about the numbers? Well, it really seems to me that back in the 70s, everyone was concerned about the situation, about what the numbers were at. The international treaty was put into place in 73, but by 1986, those numbers had about doubled. So we were looking at going from about 10,000 to around 20,000 in that neighborhood by 1986. What most people don't realize is that for the IUCN red list, they had been put on as threatened with extinction in the late, early early 80s, I believe. But by 1986, they'd been taken off the list. They were sort of downlisted to least concern by 19, was it 86 or 96? 96. Anyway, they were 10 years being off the list. One of the things that happens when the animals are considered threatened is that it generates a lot of research funds for the scientists. And um, so there was a big push in the early 2000s to get them uplisted again to a threatened status. And so they were considered in 2006 threatened with extinction again on the red list. And then, the, of course, the U.S. followed in 2008, putting them on the endangered species list in the U.S. And what that does is free up a lot of funds and it really has been a push, lots of graduate students, a lot of more research. So really, it seems what these people are doing is trying to protect their jobs more than anything else, because I don't see in any of the information that's out there any real advantage that has come to the bears themselves. Considering the vastness of the Arctic and the wide-ranging behavior of polar bears, how do researchers define and delineate research areas to effectively study these animals? Well, as far as I can determine, what they've done is put to collars, satellite collars, tracking collars on female bears and just watch to see where they actually move and to see if there's a limit to how much movement there is across the Arctic. And what they found is that while there is some overlap between the areas that they demark, most of the bears within that subpopulation actually stay within the boundaries. You are saying before how researchers have this incentive to undercount the bears as a way to keep funding. Com kind of reminds me of the homeless crisis in 
like California, the bigger the problem is, the more money they receive. And same thing with a lot of nonprofits, say the cancer. If you got rid of cancer, then if you're working for the, say the American Cancer Institute or whatever, essentially you'd be out of a job, right? Is exactly. That, yeah. Right. So you think it's just as simple as the researchers themselves don't want to well, there is that component of it, and I think that can't be discounted. But I think the other possibility is in the 1970s and 1980s, there were some things happening with polar bear populations that the biologists couldn't explain. And I think that they were running up against a problem of not being able to explain declines in population numbers when they should have been either stable or increasing. And the whole climate change issue came along just at the right time for them to sort of latch on to that and present that as an explanation for what was going on rather than f not getting funding for their research because they couldn't explain what was actually happening. And I'll give you an example that coming from Western Hudson Bay, so near Churchill, Manitoba, and that population has been under study since the 1960s, primarily because it's so easy to get to. So it's been studied for a long time. But there was a decline in population numbers, but even more than that, in the condition of the bears and in the survival of cubs in the late 1970s and through the 1980s that really was confounding and that they weren't able to explain that decline that was going on. That was well before any issues were coming up in terms of climate change or lack of sea ice and any of that kind of thing. And it was really in the late 1980s and early 1990s that those Canadian polar bear biologists were coming up with this idea, well, maybe maybe it's climate change is explaining this. And then their narrative, when you see the newer papers that come out, they just don't include the declines that happened in the 1980s. They got rid of a problem by just grabbing onto the climate change narrative. Whereas it's possible that what has been going on is that the sea ice levels or thickness rather of sea ice over the over Hudson Bay varies and that that has an impact on the survival of the bears or their overall health or that something was going on with the seal population in the bay. But whatever it was, almost certainly it's something that's going on over the winter and the biologists are simply not able to study the bears over the winter. So it's a big unknown. And at that point, they weren't able to fill in the gaps with the information that they needed to explain what might have been happening. And so the climate change narrative was a simple thing because that was sea ice extent and you could get that information from satellite images. Whereas, to my mind, what really was potentially going on was variation in the ice thickness or the depth of snow over the ice or the health of the seal population, which were variables that were just not able to be studied at that time. It seems like studying polar bears in their natural habitat would be very challenging due to the vastness and the remoteness. And I imagine it's quite expensive if you're actually going boots on the ground versus just using satellite images and things of that nature. In one of your papers, you wrote, Virtually the only area studied in any detail for polar bears and ringed seals are the coast of Hudson Bay in Canada. Most of what we know about polar bear biology is based on the easily accessible animals of western Hudson Bay, which comprise only 3-5% to 5 of the global population. How does this limited research area impact the overall understanding of polar bear behavior the dynamics and conservation efforts on a massive scale, because you really can't extrapolate that western Hudson Bay area to the whole of the Arctic. Hudson Bay is basically an inland sea. It's very shallow, and it's got very particular 
physical aspects to it that make it different from anywhere else in the Arctic. It's one of the few places where the sea ice disappears entirely over the summer. And the bears, in fact, are forced to shore for between three and four months every year. And as far as we know, that has always been true. That isn't the same as other locations around the Arctic. And we get a similar situation in the southern Beaufort Sea in Alaska. That is under American study for their biologists, but it again is a unique area in the sense that what they've seen is about every 10 years, you get really, really thick ice forming in the spring, which has an impact on the ability of the bears to effectively hunt seals early in the spring when they really need it the most. And so you have Western Hudson Bay and the Southern Beaufort being used as proxies for the rest of the Arctic when both of those areas have really quite unique aspects to it that don't apply to anywhere else that polar bears live. From what I can determine, they've settled on the Western Hudson Bay population as being used completely as a proxy for the entire population for modeling the future impacts of climate change and sea ice on it, which just seems like a silly thing to do. How big is that Western Hudson Bay area? What percentage of the whole Arctic are we talking about? Well, I mean, it's huge when you look at it on the map, but it it actually encompasses three different um, polar bear subpopulations use it. What's called the Southern Hudson Bay. So they they stay within the southern end and then Western Hudson Bay and then Fox Basin in the north. But altogether, they probably comprise between, you know, 4,500 to 5,000, somewhere in there, of those bears for those three subpopulations that use that part of the landscape. But Fox Basin bears that live in the northern end of it, they're actually doing really well. So the focus on western Hudson Bay, and even southern Hudson Bay doesn't seem to be doing as poorly as Western Hudson Bay, when you look at the studies being done on them, and they're much further south. So the idea that climate change or lack of sea ice is playing into the problem really just doesn't seem to fit the arguments that they're making. Apparently, a population survey that was done in 2021 for Western Hudson Bay bears, they claimed to have found a 27% decline in numbers, but that was not, in fact, correlated with a sea ice decline because the ice conditions had been, in fact, quite good during that period. So it doesn't fit the narrative, but of course, that's not what they're telling the media. How does this make you feel about the state of science? I think a lot of people's eyes were kind of open during COVID, especially having to wear masks for years and The researchers come out saying that the masks weren't effective. And I mean, to say that it's surprising, I would see people in the supermarket with underwear on their face and they literally were following the guidelines. And like, I'm supposed to believe that someone walking through the supermarket with underwear on their face is somehow protecting other people. In your book, you kind of talk about using the polar bear as an example of climate change. It's made people lose trust in science and in these agencies. How has this affected you personally? Well, it, it's it's really done the same thing. What I've been able to do is document what some of these researchers are saying now compared to what they said 30 years ago regarding a very similar situation. It really makes me lose my faith in being able to conduct science as a responsible, ethical scientist. And what point is there really in putting out all that effort if so much of it is being corrupted by these people with agendas? And so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I go back and forth and some days I'm down about it and I try and pick myself up and say, well, the only way forward is to keep doing what I'm doing and hope that it eventually it comes through the ethical 
uh, approach to it comes through. Do you get the criticism that you're sponsored by fossil fuel? We had Patrick Moore on, and I'm not sure if you know Dr. Robert Yoho. He was kind of a whistleblower during the pandemic. And the criticism that all these people get is that they're just basically a shill. First off, everyone needs to make an income. Just because someone's paying you doesn't mean that you're corrupted. Right. But it, it just seems like everyone's... If, if you're go against any mainstream narrative when it comes to anything that's environmental or climate related, then the first thing that they say to you is like, oh, well, you're just in bed with the fossil fuel companies. And it's interesting because the Koch brothers are one of the largest funders of solar panels. So people are like, oh, you're getting funded by the Koch brothers when the Koch brothers are funding fossil fuels and renewables, like they're hedging their bets. I mean, like, I'm not even sure what that means. And people yeah. say, say that you've had a lot of, you know, kind of a lot of criticism. What, what do you say to your detractors? The only contact that I've had has been with the Heartland Institute, which they have made the false accusation as an organization that they are heavily funded by fossil fuel interests. But I just had a contract with them to do some research for a counter IPPC report. It was a minor thing that was giving me less than a day's pay for a month. And it's ridiculous to suggest that amount of funding would sway me one way or the other when you look at, in fact, the polar bear biologists who themselves have been funded by fossil fuel interests. And I don't go around accusing Canadian biologist Ian Sterling of being swayed by funding from Shell Oil or that kind of thing when he was doing research in the 1980s, because that's ridiculous. And yet they have no problem making a similar kind of accusation towards my work right now. I don't think people really understand too much about polar bears because it's not like we're up in the north, you know, in Barrow, Alaska or Canada, whatever. What's a typical day for a polar bear? Like, where do they live? What's the habitat? What are they eating? Can you just kind of, just well, kind of like the know, base? A typ- typical day, maybe maybe if we take more of like the seasonal round in the sense that if you start in the spring, which is the really important time for polar bears, because that's when seals are born in the Arctic. So sometime between late March and April, there are millions of baby seals born throughout the Arctic. So polar bears, that's the most important time of the year for them. They consume about two-thirds of the food that they need for the entire year during that six weeks or so of the spring. And they put on fat. They can eat hundreds of pounds of fat during that time on these newborn seals. From there, they go either out onto the sea ice to spend the summer or they go to land because we've got the sea ice contracting as we move into the summer. The ice naturally is at its greatest extent in the end of March or so and with it extending down as far as Newfoundland in eastern Canada to contracting up mostly into the Arctic basin during the summer. So in some areas, bears have a choice. They can spend the summer on the ice or they can find a piece of land somewhere and wait for the ice to come back. In some places like Western Hudson Bay that we were talking about before, the bears have to, um, they're forced on land and they have to stay there until the ice reforms. But they really, they, unless they come across like a carcass of an animal that's washed up on the beach or some animal that's died, they really don't eat much of anything. <clears throat> they have been spotted eating the eggs or the fledglings of like geese. They might even chase a goose. They've been spotted some places chasing, figuring out a way to chase reindeer into the water to get some food. But primarily, they're really not eating much over the summer if they're on land. And if they're on the sea ice, their chances of actually getting a seal, even if they keep trying to hunt, are pretty pretty low because there's so much open water at that time of year that the seals have lots of chance to escape. So a bear has to be pretty lucky 
or very experienced to be able to successfully kill a seal during those summer conditions. And so they just really are in fasting mode over the summer from about, you know, late June or July, depending on the latitude, until October, November, when the sea ice returns. And so when the ice starts to form again, um, the actually the formation of the ice attracts fish to the edge because there's microscopic food in the water for them. And the fish being there attracts the seals. And that means the bears know that as soon as the ice starts to form, there's going to be seals feeding at the edge of that ice. And so they have another opportunity to start feeding on seals again in that early fall time when the ice is forming. As soon as there gets to be extensive ice, most of the bears are off on the ice and they try and find seals over the winter and they may or may not be successful. But what happens, um, not all of the bears are out on the ice in the winter. If a bear is pregnant, she will actually stay, usually on land, make a den and stay there over the winter and have her cubs um, they're usually born around Christmas time. And she nurses them until they come out of their den in, the, in March when the feeding period starts again. Only polar bear females make a den over the winter, but all of the rest of them are off on the ice trying to hunt for seals over the winter. What's kind of like the size range for a full adult female and male, and how does that compare in size to, say, a grizzly bear? Well, maximum size for a male polar bear is maybe 1,400 to 2,000 pounds, somewhere in there, for a big male, and realizing that the larger the weight is actually how much fat they put on. So they're not getting so much taller as they are just getting fatter. And females are about half that size. You can get a, a polar bear female that's close to a thousand pounds in weight, and almost always a bear that's that big and fat is pregnant. So she's putting on lots of fat because she has to go eight months without feeding until she's able to feed again in the spring. So that's taking into account about four months during the summer when she's either on land or on ice and not feeding and another four months when she's in her den having the cubs and nursing them. A female has to be quite fat in order to successfully give birth to cubs and to nurse them before they come out of the den. And, and how tall How tall are they? They can be 13 feet standing on their back legs, a big male, about four feet at the shoulders, but, but big. And then grizzlies are not quite as tall but some of them can be as heavy as a polar bear. But technically, if you're going on actual measurements, you know, length and that kind of thing, that the polar bear is considered to be the largest of the bears. And it just, some some people classify them as a land animal, but most consider them to be a sea mammal because they actually can live their entire lives at sea on the ice. The scientific name for the polar bear is sea bear. I've heard stories of polar bears swimming 500 miles. Is this true? Are polar bears able to swim 500 miles? And I mean, what speed? Oh yeah, are they? yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're they're excellent swimmers. And in fact, even cubs are good swimmers. And really small cubs, like ones that have just been born that year, that might be six months, seven months old. What they will do sometimes is crawl on their mother's back and kind of just hang on and kind of get a ride while she swims. But older cubs that are like a year old are pretty good swimmers as well, and they can go 100 miles easily. So what they do in that respect is that allows them to go from land to the edge of the ice at any time of year or between ice flows. They can move around quite a bit and use sort of pieces of ice as little islands where they can stop and rest. So a bear that swims 500 miles might actually be able to stop and rest on a piece of ice 
for a few hours and he might not be swimming the whole time. How did the polar bear become a symbol of climate change? In your book, you mentioned kind of like fear porn or environmental porn and the polar bear was at the forefront of that. How did that happen? I I think that there has always been a lot of interest in polar bears. When the climate models were suggesting that the Arctic would be the first place that would be impacted by climate change and that we would be seeing sea ice declines, that making that association with polar bears was kind of a natural association. And as I said, at the time that these climate models were first being presented in the late 1980s, that polar bear biologist in Canada, Ian Sterling, was looking for something else to really focus on in terms of his polar bear research. And this was a natural pairing. He had written a paper about what he thought was going on and the media and the climate scientists took over from there to really elevate the bear as an iconic symbol. What are the major challenges and threats facing polar bears today? The major thing I can see right now is the conflict with people. And you see biologists are saying the same thing, but what they're doing is saying that there's going to be increased conflicts with people because of climate change, because the lack of sea ice is forcing the bears on shore and that this is what is creating the problems. But in fact, they don't mention the increase in numbers and they don't mention that in previous times when people were having more conflicts with bears, it was automatically assumed that there were more bears. It's the rationale for why these conflicts are going to be more of an issue. But we've got more people living in the Arctic. There are the same issues that come up with polar bears that you have with bears further south, and that is what do people living in the Arctic do with their garbage? That's always been an attractant for bears. It doesn't matter where you are, but it's a problem for people in the Arctic. But polar bears are particularly attracted to all kinds of things, odd things that people have around them. Anything that is oil-based, lubricants, vinyl. The vinyl seats on snow machines, for example, seem to be particularly attractive. And it might also be salts or whatever from people. There's been trouble with cemeteries. What do you do with your dead in the Arctic? And is that going to attract the bears? Most people in the Arctic are subsistence hunters. Where are you going to store your food um, safely? How are you going to butcher butcher the animals and dispose of whatever waste? And that becomes a real significant issue if you've got an increasing population of bears. And we see some of that uh, on the north slope of Alaska, where you've got Inuit groups are doing their traditional bowhead whale hunting. And they're disposing of the carcass of the whales, but that's an attractant for the bears who come in and creating partially a problem for the local communities, but also a potential tourist industry because people want to come and see the bears. Are bears vicious towards humans? It seems like in your book that they're fairly docile creatures, at least towards towards people. But if you have too many bears and too many people intermingling, then does that create issues? I think it really depends on the time of year and the condition of the bear. And certainly the bears can be reasonably easy to deal with if you know what to do. Um, If the bears are well fed, like in the beginning of the summer, when they're just off the ice, they can be quite easy to discourage. But there are, of course, going to be some bears if they're coming just off the ice. They've been heavily hunting. They've been in hunting mode for months and months. And maybe some of them just don't turn off. And I think that's really what we saw in 2018 in Fox Basin, where there was an attack on a group of Inuit hunters by a female who had a cub with her, a year old cub. And she actually came off the ice. They were on shore, but there was ice nearby. They came off the ice to attack these men. And, you know, they... These bears are 
always looking for more food because being fat, the more fat they have is essential. And the more fat they have, the more secure their survival is going to be. So some of those bears can go into attack mode at any time. So you can't be sure. But the bears that are really the most dangerous are ones that are thin. And those you can could encounter at any time. But young young bears, especially young males, seem to be the ones that are initiating attacks on people. And it's partly because of, there's a behavioral hierarchy in bears. So bigger, older bears will steal a seal kill, for example, from a younger, smaller bear. So the younger bears have a hard time really getting enough food to eat. And they're the ones that are likely to be looking for food if they come on land and looking for anything to attack, including people. Yeah. How do you respond to criticisms that your research and analysis of the polar bear population is flawed or incomplete? I would say that what these people are doing is insisting that the experts that come up with their models to create an estimate number are correct all the time. But what I have done is gone through all of the information, all of those papers, and pointed out the inconsistencies that they've had. And for example, one of the things that is done all the time is to do a survey, take an estimate for one small area of a subpopulation, and then extrapolate it to the entire population. And they did that, for example, for a recent estimate that was done in the Chukchi Sea. And this was by U.S. biologists. And so they took a small area, made an estimate, and applied it to the whole thing. One of the things I did was did the same thing for the Barents Sea. The only place that we had a number was for the area around the Svalbard archipelago in the western portion. And so I extrapolated to the entire Barents Sea. Well, they have an objection to that, but why haven't they done it? That's been part of my argument that they have failed to do sensible things in terms of trying to come up with a reasonably accurate estimate when the accuracy even of their estimates are wide. They can range from 1,000 to 3,000 bear. Well, how is that a scientifically accurate estimate. It's a, a huge range. And it seems like the longer we go, the less accurate those estimates that they're making are coming out to be. Yeah. And what's the reason behind that, being less accurate the further they go? Just the methods that they're using. They're doing aerial surveys or something, whereas before they were actually capturing bears. As I said, the methods of doing that have changed over the years. And so it really becomes hard to compare one to the other. And one of the things that I I think is perfectly reasonable is to take one of the estimates for the Chukchi Sea and apply it across the areas of Russia where there have been no surveys. But they refuse to come up with any kind of numbers for those areas. And it's going to be it's going to be a guess. All of it is a guess. And it seems kind of ridiculous to me, their insistence on sticking to particular ways of doing things when so much of it is out of sync. We've got a whole bunch of these subpopulations that haven't had a survey in 30 years, and they're using the same numbers. And they don't seem to have any problem with that, but they won't come up with even a ballpark figure for some of these areas where there's been no surveys. Anyway, it, it's, it's frustrating. It seems unreasonable to me to be making those kinds of arguments and then still insisting that their estimate is the only one that's scientifically accurate. Yeah, that sounds pretty, pretty ridiculous. What are some fun kind of facts or misconceptions that we have about polar bears that you've kind of over the last 40 years have been intrigued by? Well, one fun fact is that they have a blue tongue, sort of a blue-black tongue. And I have i haven't found anything that explains why that would be so. They're the only bear that has that. And it's kind of interesting to me. 
the fact that it seems from the studies that they have done that the bears can actually survive only by eating fat. What they see is that often a bear, especially when there's a lot of seals around, like the the young seals, they basically peel the seal carcass like a banana and then scrape all the fat off and then just leave the rest of it. Adult bears particularly will do this. And that suggests that they really don't have a need for consuming protein and that they can survive purely on eating fat. What do you think that means then? Well, it, it, it doesn't mean much except that it speaks to their specialization for living in the Arctic. And it also goes against this idea somehow that the bears could, if the ice all disappeared, that they could simply come on shore and eat the same kind of foods that grizzly bears eat. And this is actually one point where I agree with the polar bear specialists who insist all the time that these terrestrial foods, like eat, eating something like a reindeer or a goose or bird's eggs or something, would sustain the bears for any length of time. And I agree with them. It really is not an option. If bears were forced on shore for the entire year and couldn't get onto the sea ice or didn't have access to seals, then they would go extinct. I don't think there's any doubt about that. There's, they're not going to turn back into grizzly bears. Is it true that polar bears evolved from grizzly bears? Is that true? Yes. Yeah. So that is, okay. Yeah. And I'm, in fact, I'm just in the final stages of publishing a book on polar bear evolution that should actually be out in a few weeks. Oh, really? And looking at that transformation from brown bear to polar bear and looking at all the evidence that we have from genetics, from fossils, and all of that to sort of try and figure out when and where they evolved, but also going into why and how exactly that might have happened. So what's the major thesis of that book? That the evolution of polar bears make a, a perfect model for how all species arise so that you can use the thing that happened to transform a grizzly bear into a polar bear it's the same kind of process that happens for virtually all multicellular animals. And so it gives us a way of looking at how evolution works most of the time. And so we've, we've just got then going into that one example gives us this big picture of how evolution works. You've written, what, well over a dozen books. You have a blog. You have numerous reports on polar bears. You know, what is the the biggest takeaway point that you want people to have? Polar bears are much more resilient than people give them credit for. And that all that is being promoted about the bears in the media and everything by the biologists really doesn't take into account their uniqueness as a species and the fact that they evolved to live in the Arctic. And the fact that they're there and have survived for hundreds of thousands of years is in fact evidence that they're able to withstand all kinds of changes in sea ice and temperature and all those kinds of things. Looking at what's happened with polar bears is I think a window on what is being said about the climate change as a potential crisis. That, you know, it's the whole thing about polar bears has been presented as a catastrophe in the making. And we've seen now that that isn't true and that people can look the same way at a lot of what is being said about climate change. And then it means that they should be looking more in depth about what is being said and taking all of that with a grain of salt because it's likely the same kind of false narrative as we've seen with polar bears. Yeah, you've read a lot about dogs. I'm just kind of curious, what is your 
overall thesis of how dogs became man's best friend, so to speak. You studied dogs before polar bears, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Right. Well, so what's really sorry, looking looking at um it's it's the idea that basically an ancestor of modern wolves basically colonized a human community, human settlement, because there was something attractive to that habitat. And that in the process of that, it transformed into a dog. That process of domestication that we are always taught was a process of taming, like a, that it was a deliberate action by ancient people to create something different that it was instead a natural speciation event that happened because the animals wanted it to happen. Essentially, they domesticated themselves by moving into this new habitat that people had created, where there was lots of refuse around human waste, those kinds of things. It was a new habitat that people had created that some wolves moved into. And as a consequence of moving into that new habitat, they actually transformed into this new species that we call the domestic dog. But that essentially the same process happened with brown bears moving into the sea ice habitat and transforming into a polar bear and becoming this new entity. So there's those parallels that we see happening across the board. Yeah, it's interesting. It kind of reminds me of one of Michael Pollan's book where He's talking about grain and corn, where it's like, who domesticated who? If you're a farmer and you're out there with your machinery and you're kind of at the whim of a lot of these crops, I mean, it seems like the corn might be more in control of you than the other way around. Well, exactly. So, Susan, you're the author of the book, The Polar Bear Catastrophe That Never Happened, which is one of the main topics we talked about today day. Where do people find this book, other books, and kind of just find your blog and get a hold of you just in general? That book is available on Amazon, but links to it are also provided on my blog, which is called polarbearscience.com. And I also have an author website. So it's just susancrockford.com. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It was a very interesting conversation about polar bears. We hear so much about it, but don't really understand a whole lot, at least at least for me. So thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. That is it for this episode of El Podcast. And once again, if you guys aren't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. And find us on Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as well. We thank you all dearly for watching and listening I will see you on the next episode.